feel his presence. Yes. You know, I have a confession to give you this morning. This is not confession Sunday, but I'm going to confess. Mm -hmm. Brother Sanchez called us to prayer, and I bowed my head, you know, and began to say words. And about two minutes into those words, I realized I was saying words, but my mind was somewhere else. Drifting, thinking about this and thinking about that. And I had to stop and ask God to forgive me. To let me, give me the strength, the courage. You know what, if I were speaking to you, but my mind was somewhere else, that'd be considered rudeness. Mm -hmm. And yet sometimes we do that. The minister says, let's pray. Let's pray for the people. Let's, whatever the prayer is going to be. And sometimes we are so automated that we can say words, we can say words that sound good, and our thoughts are somewhere else. Amen. Oh, give me the grace, to give me the, somehow yes. the strength. Yes. That when I bow my head and close my eyes and someone says pray or I decide it's time to pray, yes. that I pray, that I talk to him, that I try to block everything out and concentrate on my relationship with him. Amen. He values that one-on-one -on -one conversation. Yeah. Just like if you and I were speaking right. And, right. and thinking about somebody else, you would not, right. that would not be good. I think God sometimes, if he could, I think he'd say, I'm talking to you. Right. Listen to me. Listen to me. Yes. I think sometimes he would say that. And, yes. oh, God, give me the grace. To, to value every moment of prayer. We don't pray enough anyway. You know, I don't care. Amen. If we pray 24 hours a day, I don't think it'd be enough. Amen. And we have our prayers, and we have Monday prayer meeting, and we pray at home. But oh, I am convinced probably that the time we spend with him is still not where it should be. Oh, God put us in that position that we long for the moment, for the opportunity to pray. That we long for the moment to to just feel his touch. Just a simple chorus. And suddenly we feel his blessings and his spirit come amongst us. I'll tell you why, you can't put a value on that. You cannot put a value on that. We have already felt the word of God today than most people in most churches. I mean, I am, you know, and, and, and it is invaluable. I'm glad that. I keep saying I'm glad it's more than that. It's more than that. I am so thankful that God is with us, that I'm in a church where I feel free to raise my hand and worship. I feel free to say amen. Thank you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I feel free to say preach it, brother. And I hope I have the gumption and the strength when he says something that corrects me that I say, Lord, help me to be more pleasing to you. Amen. Yes. Amen. God is good, and He is greatly to be praised. Amen. Amen. I have one last uh, scripture. Yeah, one last note. Hello. Let me start over. I have one scripture I'd like to read for you this morning. It's in Second Kings, the thirteenth chapter, in the fourteenth to the nineteenth verse. This was when Elisha was on his deathbed. On his deathbed, and Joash the king came to see him. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he had died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. That term he was using to say simply, You are the one who carries Israel, and horses were a symbol of power. You were that power that was behind Israel. And the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take a bow and arrow bows and arrows, and he took him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand on it, and Elisha put his hand upon the king's hand, and he said, open the windows eastward, and he opened it, and Elisha said, shoot. And he shot, and he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance of, from Syria, for thou shalt smite the Syrians in Ephraim, till thou have consumed them. Then he said, take the arrows, and he took them, and he said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground, and he smote thrice, three times. 
and stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. Then thou hast smitten Cyril, uh, Syria till thou hast consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Israel but thrice. Right. Amen. Under the reading, can you say amen? Amen. amen. You may be seated. And I have one more scripture I'll just read quickly for you. Galatians 5 and 7. Paul is speaking. And he's talking to the Galatians and said, You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? He was saying you were running, he was, and to put it in our vernacular, he was saying you were running so well. What stopped you? What stopped you? I want to talk a little bit about a half-hearted effort. A half-hearted effort. You know, we sing a popular song, you've probably heard it more than once. Prayer is the key to heaven, but faith unlocks the door. Words are so easily spoken, but faith. See what is this? Prayer, a prayer without faith, is like a boat without a door. Faith is important, and that is true. Amen. But that song is partially true, in the sense that, in the sense that, feeble, or wavering faith, it takes more than that. It takes a persistent faith. Yes. That you are convinced and you are persistent in your, in your belief that God can carry out whatever you need for him to carry out. In Luke we read a story and Jesus told a parable. There was, there was in the city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city and she came unto him saying, Avenge me of my adversary. We don't know what her problem was, but she was asking the king to take care of this problem and he would not for a while but afterward he said to himself though I fear not God nor regard man yet because this woman troubleth me I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she weary me yes the widow came to him he said would you take care of that he said no and she left but then she comes back over and over and over again and finally the, the this, this judge is saying, I'm going to have to create a wish. She's going to drive me crazy. Basically what he said. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. Right. And shall not God avenge his own elect yes. with cry day and night unto yes. him? Though he bear long with them, I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. If we are persistent in our prayers. Let me tell you a personal story that happened years ago. Years ago in Wyoming, I was a uh, real estate broker for a fairly large company there, real estate company. And it was owned by an individual person who decided to sell the company. And I was a little bit unsure about what was going to happen. And about the same time, there was a major new home builder that was moving into the state of Texas, in fact, Pulte Home Corporation, they still build here in Houston. And uh, they were looking for someone. I went and applied for the position, talked to the, to the director, said, you know, yeah, you know the, the usual procedure, Bob, we appreciate you coming in. We'll sure keep you in mind and let you know, things like this. The next day, after, afterward, he was in Laramie, his office was in Laramie, I was in Casper. I called the next day, all right, this is Bob. We're just checking to see if you've made a decision yet. No, not yet, Bob. We're still thinking about it. The next day, I called <laughs> and I said, "This is Bob. Just you know, just checking." No, I haven't, Bob. Not yet. Next day, I called. The secretary answered. Well, he's busy right now. I'll pass on your message that uh, we want to talk to him. I called the next day. To make a long story short, I called nine days in a row. Nine days in a row. On the tenth day, I got through to him, and he says, Bob, I guess I'm going to have to hire you to keep him calm. And he did. He hired me, and it worked out. You know, within eight or nine months, I was the vice president up there, which didn't turn out to be that great a position. And, uh, but anyway, we can be persistent, persistent in our daily life. Sometimes we pursue 
goals without sort of half-hearted. I can tell you as a teacher, I see that practically every day. Even in, you know, I, in, in my teaching, I have students who are there, but they're not there. You know, I had, I had one student ask me two years, it was about two years ago now, his first, I mean, first day introduction, things like this, you know, we're going to you know, all the stuff, go through the, the syllabus, things like this. And he says, Mr. Dunn, I said, yeah, what do you need? He says, how many days can I miss and still pass? <laughs> I said, well, we'll find that out. We'll find that, and sometimes that's sometimes that's our relationship with our God. Dear God, I love you. I appreciate you. I want you. By the way, what can I get away with and still make yes. it to heaven? Yes. What can I do and still make it to heaven? Persistence is what we need in our walk with God. In First Kings, the 18th chapter, we read about there was a famine in Syria. There was a famine in Syria, Syria, and Elijah, I mean, the prophet Elijah had just called down fire from heaven, and uh, he had gone, he had just killed the 450 prophets of Baal, and right after that, of course, the, the, with the famine and the drought, he, go, he, he, tells, he tells Ahab, he said, get ready, there is a sound of an abundance of rain. Yes. When he said that, there was nothing. That's right. Ahab probably looked around and said, yeah. the sky is clear. Yes. It's like it is today in Houston. It's going to be 102. I mean, yeah. I don't see any rain. Why do you say that? But the Bible tells us that, Ahab, that, that Elijah left there. He went to, to, talk to the top of Mount Carmel and it says he fell on his face and began to pray. Yes. He prayed for a while. He tells his servant, go look and see. Go look toward the sea. And what do you see? The servant comes back. Clear skies. It's hot, boss. Elijah falls on his face again and begins to pray. Prays for a while. He tells his servant, go take a look. Nothing there. Boss. Still clear. Does that seven times Yes. On the seventh time, the Bible tells us Elijah stood up, tells his tells servant to go look. He comes back, he says, I see a cloud mm -hmm. the size, about the size of a man's head. And Elijah probably said, that's it. Yes. Go tell Ahab yes. to get ready. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. And the scriptures tells us that in verse 45 of that chapter, and it came to pass in the meantime that the heaven was black with clouds. In wind and there was a great rain. The persistence of Elijah. The persistence of Elijah. We can we can pray. I mean, I know we, we spoke, we're supposed to have faith and pray and ask and wait. But I am convinced that God rewards persistence. He rewards those who search for Him, persistently search for Him. It's not a matter of just a moment. And to say, Lord, where are you? And then the rest of the time, we're not concerned. But we need to persistently look for Him. We search for God in many, for many different reasons. There is a there is a spiritual quest. I think of a, for, you know sometimes a spiritual quest simply wanting to know what the purpose of life is. I think of a person that. Sometimes he's reviled in, in apostolic areas. And John Charlie and Charles Darwin, who wrote the books concerning evolution and things like this. But if you read his book, the the the, the Origin of Species in 1859, he talks about. Of course, he talks about how plants and animals adapt. That's true. But he also talks about. The beauty of the creation, of the beauty of God's creation. He admires when he studies nature. At the end, he, he talks about the, the, the incredible intricacies of creation that God created. You would think this man is close to discovering God. But then a few years later, 
And a few years later, in 1871, he writes a, he writes a book called The Descent of Man, in which he has finally decided that it's true, man must have descended from the ape. Somehow in his search, in his, in his, it was an intellectual search for God, but somehow he allowed himself to, to I mean, and Charles Darwin was a minister for 10 years, his early years he was a minister, but somehow he lost track of, of what he was seeking for and allowed himself to be, to be, to be mistaken, really, is what it is. Yes. There is a request. There is a, a quest sometimes simply out of curiosity. People seek for God because I hear there's a God. I wonder where He is. It's not a matter of trying to have a spiritual connection. It's just a matter of determining if there is a curiosity. Is there a God? Where can I find Him? Where can I find Him? Unfortunately, that that's not the type of resistance that God persist that, that he wants that he wants we've seen people and you've probably seen some myself but yourself if you've lived long enough there are people who have a desperate a desperate search for God you'll hear them sometimes I've heard them in church more than it's been years I admit but oh if there is a God if there is a God help me help me in desperation we pray we cry out to him in desperation, if there's a God, if there is a God somewhere, oh God, help me in this position, in this situation. And you know, God in His in His mercy sometimes answers. Yes, He, he answers that cry. But the problem with a desperate search for God is that once that crisis is over, yes, once that crisis is over, we kind of forget. Yes. What God has done for us. Mm -hmm. Yes. What God has done for us. And we kind of revert back many times to our own ways. But then there's that last one, the hungry search for God. Those who understand that there is a God. And you say, I know you're there. I know you're there. Yes. Let me touch you. Let me know you. Let me feel your power. Let me, let me, somehow let me connect with you. Somehow let me connect with you. That's why that's why sinners come to the altar and repent and they're baptized and they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost because it's not a matter of desperation. No, they, there's that desperation in there. That's true because we know there's a judgment. But we're, that we come to God because we're hungry for Him. We are hungry for Amen. Him. Oh, God, give us that hunger today. Yes. I don't care where you are in yes. your spiritual walk. You may have received the Holy Ghost last week. Yes. Or it may have been 65 years ago. 65 years ago. Let that hunger still be there. Amen. That we want, that we want to feel his touch and feel his guiding power. Those who hunger to know God and do know God and have a relationship with him, have a relationship with him, Somehow we develop a passion in our love for God. How else can you explain? To the, to the person who doesn't understand a relationship with God, they do not understand why we have a church that we are faithful to. They don't understand that we go to church as often as we do. They don't understand that we pray as much as we do. They don't understand that we give credit to God when God blesses us. Yes. They don't understand. To, to, to them, at this moment, you are wasting your time. To those who don't understand a yes. relationship with God. You're in a church when you could be, you know, you could be sleeping late. Come on. Sunday morning is when everybody sleeps late. That's when you're supposed to sleep late because it's a good day off. But here we are. We got up early this morning. We fought the traffic. We came to church. And within five minutes after church began, we began to feel his spirit. Amen. Yes. Oh, uh, there's a hunger that has to be there for yes. to feel yes. that spirit. There has to be that hunger. Right. Yes. Why do we do that? Why do we why do we clap our hands when we sing? Why do we sing? Why do we raise our hands? Come on. Why do we worship him? Why do we praise? Why do we worship? 
I think Jeremiah has the best answer. Jeremiah has the best answer. But his word was in my heart. And it's a burning fire. Yes. Shut up in my bones. Yes. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. That's right. right. If you're in your if you're in that position with God, you can't help yourself. Amen. You've got to praise him. Yes. You've got to praise him. Yes. 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 When the spirit begins to move, when the spirit begins to move, you can't you can't sit there. You gotta do something. You gotta bow your head, clap your hands, raise your hands, sing, do something. You have to because it's it's there, it's burning. You have to honor him. You have to praise him. You have to praise him because we can't help it. We can't help it. Because that's what he has given us, that relationship and that desire that to serve him, that persistence. But Lord, I am going to, I want to be blessed for you by you. And just like that, I've told you more than once in my testimony that night I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. As I was walking toward that altar at the youth camp, I told myself and probably told God, this is it. This is going to be it. I'm going to receive the Holy Ghost tonight. And I did. Because I, re I was not going to leave until I did. That's the persistence that God rewards. That's the persistence that God rewards. During the war, another, here's another history note. During the War of 1812, when the British invaded the America, the British warrants just attacked a coastal little coastal village off the coast of Maryland with cannon fire. The British had these tremendous ships that the Americans didn't have. And they began to bombard the city to the point that everyone vacated the city except one man, one man. His name was John O'Neill. His name was John O'Neill, and by himself, he loaded cannon and fired cannon at these ships for an hour, at least an hour or two, the history says, until he was finally injured himself by a cannon blast from the, from the British. The British came ashore. The British came ashore, captured him, took him back to the ship. And in gentlemanly ways, the British did back then. They said, we condemn you to death, but we're going to let you get well first, and then we'll hang you. Because that was the way it was, it was normally done back then. So they threw him into the brig, into the jail. Word got out in, his, in, his, in the back of the city. He had a daughter, his, a daughter named Matilda. She was 15 years old. She heard, somehow she found out where her father was. Someone saw him being taken out to the ship. And in the dark of night, she took a rowboat and rowed out to the ship, climbed aboard, and asked to speak to the admiral. And she, they, brought, they brought her into the admiral and she began to, to beg and plead for the life of her father. And arguing that he was just a short soldier doing his job. The admiral was so impressed. The admiral was so impressed with her persistence and her insistence on talking to him and her pushing over and over again, arguing for her father, that he released her father, gave her the, the history says, a measure of gold, and sent him back to, back to shore. Her persistence saved her father's life. Persistence, I've said it a dozen times already. I'll tell you this, think about eternity for a minute. Yes. The only people, the only group that's gonna look forward to eternity, to eternity are those people, that group, that single group, his church that has a relationship with him. Yes, yes. For everyone Amen. else, his judgment. For everyone else, his judgment. <laughs> that same, in that, that church, in order to be in that position, to be in that honored group that is saved by him when the rapture takes place. It's going to take persistence on our part. It's going to take persistence on our part. It's the same persistence as I've already mentioned that when we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We do not receive the Holy Ghost, I'm convinced, by accident. We're not sitting back in our pew back there somewhere and people are up here praying and worshiping and you're, we're sitting back there just letting the time go by and suddenly, without warning, the Holy Ghost falls on us. 
Doesn't work, work that way, folks. No. We have to make that commitment to Him. Yes. And that commitment of persistence that, Lord, I am going to follow you regardless. Amen. I'm going to follow you no matter what happens, good, bad, or indifferent. Yes. I am going to follow you. In fact, the apostle said this, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Yes. Forgetting those things which are behind, That's reaching right. forth unto those things which are before. Yes. I press toward, toward the, mark. the mark. We press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling oh, yeah. of God in Christ Jesus. Yes. We have to press. And we, we are going to be saved on purpose. We're going to save ourselves on purpose. We're not going to be saved by accident. Amen. In Luke 11, 5, God, he tells us another story. He says, he says unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. Here. I say unto you, Though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his, that's the visitors, because of the visitors importunity, that's a good word, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. Yes. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and him to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Yes. I like the amplified version of that scripture when it starts defining what the word importunity means. It says, and yet because of his visitor's persistence and boldness, yes. he will get up and give him whatever he needs. Yes. So I say unto you, ask and keep on asking, and it shall be given. Seek and keep on seeking, and it you shall find. Knock and keep on knocking, and the door will be opened unto you for everyone who keeps Yes. All asking persistently receives. He who keeps on seeking persistently finds, and to him who keeps on knocking persistently, the door will open. Amen. Amen. A, 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 even a believer who is not persistent, perhaps maybe another word would be passionless. I think there's a certain amount of passion that's required in following God. There is a passion. <laughs> when it comes to worship and love and re relationship with him. A, passion, a, a passionless person will not have a determination to exercise the faith that need, needs to be exercised. And as a result, in Revelation 3.15, I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. Mm -hmm. We come to church. We come to church. We're here. We're dependable. We're here. But no, no reaction, no worship, no sing, no praise, no testimony, no prayer, just hear. He says, he says this, I would that thou art, new, but that you're neither not hot nor cold, I would that thou were yes. hot or cold. Yes. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew thee out of my mouth. We live, we have to live determinedly to live for God. Galatians 6 and 9, and let us not be weary in well-doing. Yes. For in due season we will reap if we faint not. Faint not. Psalm 16, 8, and I have set the Lord always before me. Yes. Because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Right. I shall not be moved. For that pit for persistence, he rewards us. Second Chronicles 5, 17. Be ye strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. Matthew 24, 13. But he that shall endure, that means he persists yes. unto the end, the same shall be saved. In Vietnam years ago, in Vietnam years ago, the, the Americans found out, in, in closing, the Americans found out as they began to move into the country, the country in the South, South Vietnam was heavily forested, a lot of jungle area, hard to, to travel, to walk through. I couldn't understand how that would be because my son and daughter-in-law just bought some property in Magnolia 
you know, undeveloped property. The first time they looked at it a year ago, you could not walk 10 feet into the property with vines and trees and bushes and stuff like this. Imagine being a military unit trying to walk through that. The Americans found out that there had to be someone in front cutting their way through. But because of that, it's like going through a tunnel. And the Americans had to walk in single file, five to 10 meters apart, each soldier as they walked along. The enemy soon discovered the best way to fight that was to wait until they get they start picking them off from the backward, from the end forward. The, the soldier on the very end was the most undefended, undefended soldier. In World War II, tank battle was popular in the Eastern Front as the, as the Russians began to, to take back the land from Germany. In the middle of 1944, there was a one time at six o'clock in the morning on June, on June morning, on a thousand mile front, 10,000 tanks began to fire and move at one time. It was, it was perfect tank property. Rolling hills, two trees, but in, 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 in the forested areas, and even in, even in what Vietnam, the trouble was, it was, there was, there was, because of the forest, the tanks had to go single file. As he went single file, the enemy sat and took, always took the last tank out and worked the way as far as it could to the front. Even in aircraft formations, as aircraft, even bombers, tankers, fighters, makes no difference. As they travel in formation, it's those planes that are on the peripheral, on the edge, that are the most easily taken out. Yes. Even in a naval formation, the war, the great convoys of World War II, when hundreds of ships left New York, going to England, taking arms and munitions and soldiers to fight. The, 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 the greatest danger was on the ships that were on the outside, where they were trailing in back. They were trailing in back. The safest location for all the, for that soldier in that, in that line, in that tank, with that tank, or that aircraft, or that ship, the safest position was right in the middle. Ladies and gentlemen, whether you realize it or not, we are in warfare today. Right. We are in warfare today. The enemy Come on. is all around us. Yes. Right. The enemy is all around us. Where is the safest place? Right in the middle of church. Yes. Not on the outside right. edge right. somewhere. Right. Don't be an out, don't From be an out. edge, don't Take be a, don't be on the perimeter. Yes. Be in the church. Yes. When the preacher says pray, we pray. When we worship, we worship. Yes. When we praise, we praise. When yes. we kneel, we kneel. When we testify, we testify. Be in part. Be right max back in the middle of the church. And you will be in the safest place on this earth. Yes. Amen. The safest place on this Amen. earth. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Help us today Amen. to yes. understand there is a persistence that's required of us to be saved. Help us to be in that safest place right in the middle of the church. May God bless you.